that you are all well and thank you so much for tuning into today's faith address. My name is Eric Yoko and today I will be sharing with you and hope that you will be edified even as you listen. Um, for those who are new and maybe don't know the reason for this faith address, um, in the recent weeks one of the things that has been happening is due to the global pandemic, messages of fear, panic and uncertainty have been communicated all around the world in the news and in social media and in looking, in looking to counter that voice and in looking to minister a message of faith and hope to the believer and to the world and, not co and to draw them away from a place of responding to fear, we are looking to minister this message of faith and hope and cause the believer to be edified as they listen and to draw their hearts to the promises, the preparation and the goodness of God despite the circumstances that are happening all around the world. So even as you listen, our hope is that you will be edified, you will be built up and that you will see the goodness and the preparation of God in these times. So even as we start, I'll start with the word of prayer. Father, I thank you for this day. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you that it is a light to our path and a lamp to our feet. I thank you that, Father, even as we listen, we will be built up and edified to receive of your promise, your goodness, and our inheritance as sons of God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So as we begin, we'll turn to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 11, which I believe most of us know because um, it was such a common verse as we were growing up. And so we'll just I'll just start by reading them. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. So in this, most of us are familiar with this verse. Most of us have heard this verse being preached or just you've read it somewhere. So one of the things that is not familiar with most people is the background that's happening as this verse is being written. When this verse was being written, it was written to the Israelite people by the prophet Jeremiah. And he was writing to the Israelite people as they were being taken captive by the Babylonian people. Now we begin to see that the Israelite people are in full of fear. They are in full of discouragement and despair because they don't know what their future will be. They don't know what's going to happen to them because at this moment they are being taken away from their homes. They are being taken away from their where they grew up. Some of them, some of the families are being separated and they're looking at this circumstance and they're just seeing their end in this point. They're seeing that it's over for them. But in this moment, God is crying out a message of faith and hope to the believer, to the Israelite people in this time. And he's telling them that despite the circumstance, I'm still, this is, these are my plans for you. My plans to you are to give you a hope and a future. My plans for you is to give you an expected end and that you will not respond to what is happening in the natural, but rather you will hold on to my word, which is looking to give you a hope and a future. And so just like just like the Israelite people, we are in those uncertain times where there's fear and panic, but God is still ministering faith and hope to the believer. He's ministering faith and hope on which they will stand on and see the promise of God, see the goodness of God in our lives. So um, even as we start, I want us to see how is it that we can posture ourselves to see his goodness? How is it that we can posture ourselves to inherit what he has prepared for us even in this um, even in these circumstances that are happening all over the world. So um, in the book of Genesis, one of the, as we just begin, um, Genesis chapter one, we see that God um, create, God's, God's creation, God is creating the world, God is creating the man. And we see that God finishes creation. And at the end of creation on the sixth day, this is what he says in Genesis chapter one, verse 31. God saw that all he has, all he had made, and it was very good. Once you read this, um, one of the things I want us to take note of, when God is saying this statement, we see according to the account of Genesis, everything that God has made is good. All of it has been created to give glory to God. All of it has been created to show the greatness and the wonder of God. And then we also see that God makes man. And so one of the things I want us to see is when God is saying that all that he has made is good, one of the things that he does is, we notice is there is no sickness that he has created according to the account of Genesis. There is no death or destruction that he has created according to the account of Genesis. So we see from this account of Genesis, which is the original intent of God for creation, we see that he did not intend for death, for death, 
destruction to be part of creation or to be an experience in creation. It was not his desire because we know that God is a giver of life. This is his desire to give life. So in the original intent, we see that there is no death or destruction. So someone might ask, so where did death and destruction come from? So in Genesis chapter 2, after we see that God has made the man, he comes to Genesis chapter 2 verse 9. Um, it says, the Lord made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge and of good and evil. So we see that there are two trees in the garden. Then we go to verse 17. We begin to see, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So we begin to see that the fact is um, that, the, that God told the man not to make the choice of eating the tree of good and evil. The reason why this was the case was because should the man choose to eat it, he will experience death. Death would rule over the man and as a result rule over creation. So the thing is, we begin to see that death was not a function of the will or the operation of God, but rather death is a function of the man. How death was introduced into the into the into the world and into the life of the man was not as a result of God, but rather as a result, but rather as a result of the choice of the man. And we begin to see also in James chapter one, for those who might be saying, but why did God plant the tree in the garden? God comes and says something just to um, about his nature in James chapter one, verse 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. So we begin to see the question was not about planting the tree in the garden. The question about was about the fact is when the man was drawn away by his lust, and then this lust led him to a place of sin, and then sin resulted in death. So we see that death is not a function of the will of God. It's not a function of the operation of God. But rather, death is a function of the choice of man. Where the man chooses to go against the commandment and the will of God, what resulted is man entered into death. And we begin to see that um, death began to reign in the world. So um, we'll just see this. We'll just open a few scriptures just to see where this is being indicated. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12, we begin to see um, one of the things that is said in this verse. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. So we begin to see sin entered the world not through the will of God, not through the mind of God, but rather sin entered the world because of the choice of the man. This is also communicated in Romans chapter 5, verse 17. For if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Christ Jesus? So it says that the trespass of one man, death reigned. So we see death was introduced because of the choice of the man. The reason why I'm communicating this is so that you can be single-minded about God's intent for your life. You can be single-minded about what God has prepared for your life because you are seeing death and destruction was not as, as a result of the will of God. Death and destruction was a result of the choice of the man. When the man chose to go against the commandment of God, death came in. So we see it's not the operation of God, but rather it's the choice of the man. So we can expect that the only intent that God has for the man is to give man life because we see the only thing that causes death was the choice of the man not the will of God so that is, so we need to emphasize this so that we understand the fact is God's only desire is to give man life and this is even emphasized in once again in the book of James let's just open there and read it once again so that we can just have that clarification um, James chapter 1 verse 16 do not be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Look at this verse. What it's saying is this, that every good thing, every good thing comes from God. And this is what he's saying. He doesn't change. 
What does that mean? It means God doesn't have moods where one day he will decide, I will be good to you. And then tomorrow he decides, I'm in a bad mood. I will cause a curse upon your life. No, it tells us God is single in his nature. God's nature doesn't change. If he is good today, he's, he has always been good and will always be good. And that's the thing. That means he will always be giving good things. Because that's his nature. That means we cannot expect anything evil from God. Why? Because his nature doesn't, his, his nature is only to give good. His nature is that of a good God and his nature doesn't change. So we begin to see that the only thing that God gives is every good thing. That's the only thing that God gives. Every good thing. Not cursing, not destruction. So we begin to see that what caused death to reign in the life of the man and in um, the in, on the earth was the result of the choice of the man. That man went against God's intent and God's commandment, and therefore, as a result, God, as a result, um, man experienced death. But we begin to see that despite man's mistake, despite what man did, God comes and he begins to create an operation in which the man can be redeemed from the curse, from the curse of sin, from the consequence of sin which is seen in Romans chapter 6 to verse 20, 23, where it says the consequence of sin is death. And that was the consequence of the man. So in John chapter 3 verse 16, I believe we all know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we see that despite the sin of the man, despite what man did, what God comes and does is that he comes and sends his only son to act as a payment for sin. That anyone who comes to him, they would receive the forgiveness of sin and in that receive eternal life. So we're just going to open a few scriptures just to see this so that we see where God redeemed the man, how God redeemed the man. So um, we're just going to open first to um, Romans, chapter, Romans chapter 6 verse 23 just to read it. Romans chapter 6 verse 23. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we see that the gift of God is eternal life. And in John 3, 16, we are from reading that the love of God in its operation was to give man life. Now let us see this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 to 14. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 to 14. As we see the operations of God. Mm, Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 to 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. And what the promise of the Spirit is, is eternal life, which is communicated once again in John chapter 3, verse 16. So how God chose to save the man is by sending his only son, Jesus Christ, onto the earth so that he can be able to be the sacrifice, be the atoning sacrifice for sin, becoming a curse for himself, taking upon himself the curse of sin upon himself on the cross and becoming sin for us. And therefore, when he did this, what happened is man was delivered from the curse of sin and then in the resurrection of Christ, man was justified and made righteous once again with God. That is now the operation of God in order to redeem the man from the place where he was in sin and in death. That God would now be able to take the man away from his experience of sin and death, but bring him now to a place of fellowship with God and life eternal. So we begin to see this. This is also communicated once again in Romans chapter 5 verse 8. Um, Romans chapter 5 verse 8, he communicates it again. Um, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What this message is communicating once again is that through the death of Jesus, God was able to redeem the man. That is how God delivered the man from the consequence of sin. That is how God delivered the man from the consequence of the one man's trespass by giving up his son to be the atoning sacrifice for sin. So now that we see that God has given up his son, that God has um, gone through the operation of saving the man, delivering the man from um, the work of the enemy and from the curse of sin, we begin to see that God now has an intention. His intention is that the man have life. John 10.10 10 says, The thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. 
but I have come that you may have life and have life abundantly. So we begin to see that the intent of God in giving Jesus was that man would have life and life eternal. It was not just that God would, that um, your sins would be forgiven. That was the beginning point. The beginning point is that your sins are now forgiven. But then the continuation is this, is that you will experience life and life eternal, which would happen through the Spirit of God. That the Spirit of God was given to you. And it says in the book of, um, I believe it should be First John chapter 5, where it says that he who has the Son has life. He who has the Son has life. What that means is, if you have received the Spirit of God, if you are born again, you have eternal life. You have the eternal life of God in you and as you learn to operate in it you will learn to experience the life of God that he has prepared for you so the question now becomes now that I am born again now that I have eternal life now that Jesus has forgiven me of my sins and reconciled me to God how then do I experience this fellowship with God and eternal life in the midst of this crisis that the world is speaking about so we begin to see that um in, let's open to um, the book of Proverbs chapter 3 so that we can see what is communicated. So you might be there and you're saying, um, I'm born again, um, I'm spirit-filled, I speak in tongues, and you're wondering, so how then will I experience the promise of God? How then will I experience the eternal life that God has prepared despite the circumstances that are happening in the world? So Proverbs chapter 3, this is what it says from verse 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. So now that you have eternal life, now that you have the life of God in you, the question is not about God giving you anything. The question is about you receiving what God has already given because God has already given eternal life. He has already given eternal life to all those who have believed. It's not a prayer request. It's a question of how you are you born again. And if you are born again, you have eternal life. So the question is, how do I experience eternal life? So the Bible comes and tells us to learn to trust in the Lord with all our hearts and lean not on our own understanding. So let us see this. Why is it important to lean not on our own understanding? Let's open to Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12 and say this. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12 says this. There is a way that seems to be right, but in the end it leads to death. This is what the Bible is saying. That, the pro that if you choose to lean on your own understanding... Despite the fact is, yes, you might be born again. Yes, you might be spirit filled. But the fact is, if you choose to lean on your own understanding, the Bible is telling us that leaning on your own understanding is a pathway to death. So yes, you can be born again and you can be spirit filled, but you can still be walking towards death because you're not leaning on the word of God, but rather you are leaning on your own understanding. So that's why the Bible comes and tells us in Proverbs chapter 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Because when you learn to trust in the Lord, he, learns to, he, will, he is the one who will direct your path. It says, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. He will direct your path. Direct your path towards what? Towards goodness, towards his preparation, towards his faithfulness and his abundance towards your life. So the question is might be, okay, how do I trust in the Lord? How do I put my trust in the Lord? So let's open to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and let's see how is it that we can put our trust in the Lord because we have seen that is the way in which we can experience eternal life. If you're born again, you already have eternal life. You don't need to pray for it. Eternal life is part of the born again nature. It is part of your inheritance as a born again person. So we begin to see, so how then do I experience eternal life? So in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, um, we're going to read we're going to read um from verse 16 but whenever anyone turns to the lord the veil is taken away okay let's let's read it now from verse 15 even to this day when moses is read a veil covers their hearts now this verse is talking about the, what is happening in the old testament where uh, what used to happen in the old testament where there would be the reading of the word of god but because the people's hearts were hardened um, and not able to perceive the, the mystery of the word of god they didn't understand it there was a veil over them they didn't understand the message 
that was being communicated to them. So it says that even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their heart. And how I would assume it, how I would take it in um, in this, just these present times, is that a lot of people, as they are reading the word of God, um, they read it as a means of encourage. They read it um, as a means of, the as an encouraging part, something to encourage their hearts. Not as something that upon which to build their life. They read it as a, as a means, just as an encouragement. You know, um, when things are bad, you just turn to the word of God as a means, just as to be able to um, make myself be at peace or to give myself some joy. And, yeah, and just remind myself, God is still there. Um, and that's, some, that's one of the reasons why some people read the word of God. However, I want us to see something. It says that when they were reading it, a veil lied over their hearts. What does that mean? It meant that as they were reading it, they couldn't see God's preparation. They couldn't see God's goodness. They couldn't see God's faithfulness as they were reading it. They just read it as any normal book. And because they read it as any normal book, what happened is it, there was a veil over their hearts and they did not experience what God wanted them to experience. But we are not of those who read the Bible as if it's a normal book. I want us to see something in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. This is what it says. When a person decides to read the word of God, not as a Bible study, just not just as um, a normal book or just something just to make them a good Christian. If you decide to turn to the Lord, if you decide to see that this book is just not a normal book, but this book is the word of God, the living word of God that gives life, that will show me the goodness and the preparation of God towards my life. If you choose to read the word of God in that manner, this is what the Bible says. Now it says, verse 16, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Your eyes are opened. What it means is your eyes, your eyes of your understanding will be enlightened to see the goodness, the preparation, and the faithfulness of God over your life. That is what it means when the veil is taken away. When God says, when you study the word of God, not as a book, not as just an, another ordinary book, and not just to pass time. No, when you are reading it with the intent of seeking the Lord and turning your heart towards God, this is what he says is going to happen. He says, the veil will be taken away, and the eyes of your understanding will be opened and that is very um that's very important because if you're reading it um just just to pass time or you're reading it with the intent of seeing god's preparation i assure you you will miss out a veil will lie over your over the eyes of your understanding and you won't see what god is communicating to you however if you read it in the place of honor of this is the word of god that gives life to all those who find it it says the veil will be taken away and this is what happens when the veil is taken away it says that the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That as you are interact, as, that as you are interacting with the Word of God, you are in the, interacting with the Spirit of the Lord. You are interacting with the Spirit of Truth, and it says, "Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom." And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's gro glory are being transformed into His image with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. This is what he's saying. As we're reading the word of God with the intent to see the preparation and the goodness of God, the veil will be taken away. And what is going to happen is you will begin to see the mystery of God. You will begin to see the hope that God has prepared for you, the expected end that God has prepared for you in the scriptures. And what is going to happen is it's going to begin to liberate your heart from the place of fear, from the place of panic and the fear of uncertainty that is trying to cripple the hearts of men. It will begin to liberate you and then begin to cause a joy to begin to spring up in your heart. That is what's going to happen if you choose to take to read the word of God in that place of honor. Now let's see it again, another verse where it talks about it in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. This is what it says. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, 
what no ear has heard and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. So this is what the word of God is saying. That there is a wisdom in the word of God that the, that the wisdom of this world cannot come into. What this means is, no amount, no like it doesn't matter how high your IQ is. You can be the smartest person in the world with having the highest IQ. But this is what he's saying. The wisdom that is being spoken in the word of God is not a wisdom of this world. What does that mean? The wisdom of God does not negotiate with the circumstances or the wisdom of the world. No. When the wisdom of God comes, it comes and it declares itself. It comes and it reveals itself such that it will look absurd. What does that mean? In the midst of this crisis when people are expecting shortage what the word of god what the wisdom of god will be telling you is that expect abundance and someone would ask how can you expect that because the wisdom of the word of god is greater than the wisdom that is in the world it's greater than that wisdom so what will happen is because the people of the world cannot receive this wisdom god has hidden it for his people that all those who choose to acknowledge the lord those who choose to turn away from their own understanding and turn to the word of god in fellowship with the holy spirit what will happen is this wisdom this mystery will be revealed to them and this is what it says what no eye has seen what no ear has heard and what no human mind has conceived this is what it says when you turn your heart to the lord what the, these are, there are things that God has prepared for you in his word that your mind has not yet come into, that your mind cannot conceive that it can happen, that the fact is when people are expecting, when people are in fear of sickness, what you begin to expect is that you'll walk in greater health, you'll walk in greater, a greater place of health in your, in your life, despite the fact is people are in fear about their health, that the fact is when people are uncertain about what's going to happen in the future, you begin to declare that I will experience victory after victory, favor upon favor, grace upon grace. This is a wisdom that God has hidden in the word of God that our eyes have yet not yet come into because we, if you do not choose to turn to the Lord, you will not see this wisdom. You will choose to see that it's a time for me, you know what, to, to expect the worst, to expect that things will not go well. They expect that you know what things are going to be rough. That's what the wisdom of this world is saying. But this wisdom or that comes from the word of God is saying that you will begin to see that God has prepared for you goodness. Because it says the path of the righteous only grows brighter and brighter. What that means is when God was saying this verse, I assure you, he was fully assured of the fact is one day there's going to be an epidemic all over the world. And the fact is people, the economy of the world is going to go down and all of these things are going to ha happen. Yet despite that, this is what he declared. The path of the righteous, the path of all those who are born again grows brighter and brighter. Because he is not moved by the circumstances of this world. His word is greater. And he says that we do not live by bread alone. We don't live by the information that comes on the world. No, no, no. We live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That is what is informing us about our future. That is what is informing us about our expectation. So we say, no, we declare the God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God has destined for our glory before time began. So yes, God has prepared this. God has surely prepared for every single person who is watching me and is born again. God has prepared for you goodness and glory that is what he has prepared for you and that is what he wants you to begin to perceive he wants you to begin to grow in yourself an image of prospering despite what is happening he wills that you prosper and be in health he wills that that is his will he wills that you prosper and be in health that's the book of third john so we begin to say that is what god has desired so um so I want us to see that is what God is expecting that the believer will be conforming his heart to. Not conforming his heart to the image of fear and panic that the world is communicating, but rather com conforming your heart into this image of hope and expectation because you've seen that the path of the righteous grows brighter and brighter. That what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what has not entered the minds of men, that is what God has prepared for me. What man cannot fathom can happen to me. That's what God has prepared. That in the midst of shortage, abundance is coming. 
coming my way that is what god is saying god that is what he's saying is is coming that is what he wants you to begin to see yourself having that is what he wants you to begin to see yourself um laying hold of despite the circumstance um i want us to open even as we are coming to a conclusion to the book of john chapter 11 The book of John chapter 11 um from verse 9 Jesus answered Are there not 12 hours of daylight anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble for they see by this world's light it is when a person walks at night that they stumble for they have no light Now um Jesus is trying to communicate a message to us here he's communicating he's using the natural world to explain a spiritual principle this is what he's saying that um during the day during a normal day when you're walking in the day it is less likely that you're going to fall into a ditch it's less likely that you're going to trip over a stone it's less likely those things are going to happen why because you have the light of this world which now directs your path that tells you by the way there's a hole here don't walk in there there's a stone here don't walk in there but if it was at night it will be very difficult for you to be able to see them using natural vision because the fact is it will be too dark for you maybe to see that there's a hole or there's a stone in front of you that can stumble you or where you can stumble into so i want us to see something so this is what he's saying verse 10 it is when a person it is when a person walks at night that they stumble for they have no light um another verse that says another another translation says that um that the reason why they stumble is because they do not have light in themselves uh, and this is the spiritual principle that god is communicating um that when you're walking in the light of the word of god you will not stumble the reason why you will not stumble is because the light of the word of god the light of life is a lamp to your feet and a light to your path therefore you will not stumble into the place of fear into the place of failure into the place of panic because you have the light of this world of the, of the word of god directing your path and that's what he's saying that as you are taking the time to meditate on the word of god it's creating a light in your heart a light for you to walk into a light for you to expect the goodness of god no for you for you not to stumble into fear for you not to stumble into panic no but for you to be directed towards god god's abundance towards god's goodness that's what he's saying if you take my my word and you decide to put it in your heart what's going to happen is it's going to be a light in your heart and it's going to begin to direct your heart towards what god has prepared for you and then begin to and the holy spirit will begin to give you instructions on what to do to ex, to experience and to lay hold of what god has prepared for you That's what the word of God does. It creates an image in our hearts. It creates an expectation in our hearts. Um this is also communicated open to Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. And let's see this communicated once again. This is what it says in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory. in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever amen to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us what is that power that is at work in his that is at work within us his word what is his word doing creating a hope and a future it's creating that image that is the power that's what is at work within us his word it's taking it's it's creating an image of a hopeful future an image of prosperity and health in our hearts as we're meditating upon it and he's saying he's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above what you ask or imagine so the fact is this is not just about the fact is you know now i'm expecting that good things are going to happen no 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 he's saying according to the power that is at work within us his word it's his word that is the power that is at work within us it's not about having a vain imagination they say you know what things are going to be well no no it's about entering the word of god acknowledging the lord you know acknowledging the lord as you're reading it and allowing the holy spirit to minister a message of victory a message a message of triumph a, mini, a message of abundance in your heart and creating that image in your heart so much so that not the power of god will begin to work to fulfill that image that god is forming in your heart that even as we're taking the time to do that because um in this quarantine period we have 
um, extended amount of time, maybe you're at home and you have an, an extended amount of time just to take time in the word of God. I advise you to just to do the same, just to take time in the word of God, just to take time to meditate on his word and allow the word of God to create this image, to create this expectation and begin to lead you towards God's preparation of goodness. That in the that the testimony that you will have at the end of this entire pandemic is that I, that my path grew brighter and brighter, that I experienced triumph, that I experienced abundance, not because of my own wisdom, not because of my own ability, but because of the preparation and the goodness of the Father that he revealed to me in his word. That is how we will know that truly his plans for us are good. His plans are for us are to give us a hope and a future. They are not to cause discard. He doesn't want the world to cause us to fall into a place of despair, discard, and discouragement. So even as I, even as I conclude, um, I was going to say a word of prayer and just agree with the word of God. Agree that as a people of God, we will experience his goodness. We will see his preparation. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it gives light. And that it gives understanding to our hearts. I thank you that your word is a light to our path and a lamp to our feet. I thank you that we are experiencing your goodness. We are experiencing brighter glory. We are experiencing the greater things that you have prepared for us. I thank you that our hearts are turning away from the fear and the, the circumstances around us. But are turning our hearts towards the word of God towards your preparation and even as the Holy Spirit begins by his word to form an image in our hearts thank you that you are faithful to acknowledge it to yield to it and allow it to direct our path we thank you and we give you all the glory in Jesus mighty name amen thank you so much for joining and I hope that you have been edified have an amazing day